So this is an extraordinary American, Thomas Jefferson, who <clears throat> had an extraordinary range of talent far beyond the talent of any mortal being. He was said capable of uh, calculating an eclipse, surveying an estate, tying an artery, planning an edifice, trying a case, breaking a horse, dancing a minuet, and playing the violin. He recorded the first and last appearance every year of 37 different fruits and vegetables in markets, knew the grammar for 50 Indian languages, took three months to botanize every year, and kept grizzly bears on his lawn. <clears throat> But in 1787, <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson was insulted by a Frenchman, a man named Buffon, who described America as a land filled with degenerate and putrid animals who were shrinking in size relative to the animals in Europe. Now, no matter what Jefferson would say, Buffon would not back off from his claims. So Jefferson arranged, as he was serving as minister in France, to have a stuffed animal, an elk, carried to France. An animal which stood 11 feet tall in the central welcoming room of the ambassador's residence in Paris, by far larger than any other creature that the Europeans had seen. <clears throat> and he wrote, I had the honor of informing you some time, this is the Buffon, that I had written to some of my friends in America desiring that they would send me the complete skeleton horns of the moose in such condition as the skin may be sewed up and stuffed on its arrival. Happy, happy to be able to present to you at this moment, along with the horns of the caribou, the elk, the deer, the spiked horn buck, and the roebuck of America. They come from New Hampshire and Massachusetts, I give you their popular names as it rests with you to decide their real names. I suspect you will find the moose, the round-horned elk, and the American deer are of species not existing in Europe. The moose is perhaps of a new class. Now, recognize the strategy described in this wonderful book by David Post, In Search of Jefferson's Moose. <clears throat> At certain points, we have to show people, not say. And Jefferson's strategy was to show the Europeans to stop the argument. That's story one. Here's story two. This man is Aldous Huxley, 1927. He wrote this. <clears throat> In the days before machinery, men and women who wanted to amuse themselves were they're compelled in their humble ways to be artists. Now they sit still and permit professionals to entertain them by the aid of machinery. It is difficult to believe that general artistic culture can flourish in this atmosphere of passivity. About 20 years before, this man, who was America's greatest musician at the time, John Philip Sousa, said something similar a little bit more colorfully when he was visiting this place, the United States Capitol, testifying about this technology, the talking machine. As he said, these talking machines are going to ruin the artistic development of music in this country. When I was a boy in front of every house in the summer evenings, you would find young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs. Today you hear these infernal machines going night and day. We will not have a vocal cord left, Sousa said. The vocal cords will be eliminated by a process of evolution, as was the tale of man when he came from the ape. Now, this is the picture I want you to focus on, this picture of the young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs. This is a picture of culture. We could call it, using modern computer terminology, a kind of read-write culture. It's a culture where people participate in the creation and recreation of their culture. In that sense, it's read-write. And Sousa's fear was that we would lose the capacity to engage in this read-write creativity because of these, quote, infernal machines. They would take it away, displace it. And in its place, we'd have the opposite 
of read-write creativity, what we could call, using modern computer terminology, a kind of read-only culture. A culture where creativity is consumed, but the consumer is not a creator. A culture in this sense that's top-down, where the vocal cords of the millions of ordinary people have been lost. Now, if you look back <clears throat> at at least the 20th century and at least what we call the developed world, hard not to believe that John Philip Sousa was right. Never before in the history of human culture had its production become as concentrated, never before as professionalized, never before had the creativity of ordinary people been displaced and displaced for exactly the reasons he said by these infernal machines. The 20th century was this read-only century, ending a series of read-write creativity from the beginning of man. That's story two, one last story before we start. <clears throat> 1919, America voted itself dry, banned the consumption and production of alcohol. They did this in a war against what was to them an obvious evil, the evil was dependence, dependence upon this substance, which debilitated, importantly, the working class, as the working class was called upon to serve the purpose of progress. 1929, <clears throat> it was pr pretty clear that this war was failing. And in this place, in Seattle, the government decided it would try a new strategy to fight back against the spreading trade of illegal alcohol. And they were going to fight back <clears throat> by using a new technology, wiretapping technology. And so they wiretapped the phones of this man, Roy Olmsted, and 11 others of his compatriots. And they prosecuted Olmsted on the basis of the evidence they got from the wiretap. And Olmsted took his case to the United States Supreme Court, challenging the wiretap claiming the wiretap was illegal because there was no judicial authority for the tap. So the Supreme Court looked at this document, the Constitution of the United States, in particular the Fourth Amendment, which is this amendment. Actually, it looked a little bit more like that. And in that amendment, the Constitution says, searches shall not be unreasonable. Uh, there shall be no unreasonable searches and seizures. And so the question was what those terms meant, and Chief Justice, former President Taft, concluded that what the Fourth Amendment was intended to protect against was trespassing by the police on people's property for the purpose of searching and seizing. The wiretap didn't trespass, because what the police did was connect the wires outside of the home, so they listened to what was going on inside the home, but they never actually entered the home. And so therefore, there was no violation of the Fourth Amendment. And for almost 60 years, this was an unregulated, constitutionally unregulated uh, area of criminal law. But in an important dissent, <clears throat> this man, Justice Frankfurter, said that what the court should do is to articulate a principle, to principle to protect the invasion of private spaces by government actors to protect the privacy of these spaces, because that was the purpose of the Fourth Amendment. And how you did that was going to depend upon the state of technology. As he said, quoting an earlier case, time works changes. But what that means is that we need to translate the protections, old protections, into a new context. And if he translated such protections, he would have found that the Fourth Amendment protected against the government listening to your telephones just as much as it protected against them entering your house and searching your closet. Well, Brandeis lost in that case. The wiretap won. But the war that the wiretap was part of was increasingly recognized to be a failure. And in 1939, the country recognized the failure uh, because of two obvious factors. Number one, the war against alcohol was experiencing increasing costs, the rise in organized crime, the fall in civil rights, like the wiretapping case. And increasingly, people saw vanishing benefits, because of course, despite prohibition, everyone drank. <clears throat> and so they realized 
1933 that the cost of this war exceeded the benefits. And so 1933, they declared peace by repealing the constitutional amendment that had banned the production and sale of alcohol. But it's important to recognize what they repealed was not the aim to fight unhealthy dependence upon alcohol. What they repealed was using a war to fight it. OK, those are three stories. I want to use those stories to make an argument, an argument about copyright law. And I want you to notice certain parallels with the current debates we're having about copyright law and with these stories. So as with the war against alcohol known as prohibition, we're in the middle of another war, what people in the United States refer to as the copyright wars. What my friend, the late Jack Valenti, former head of the Motion Picture Association of America, used to refer to his, as, his own, as his own, quote, terrorist war, where apparently the terrorists in this war are our children. More than 20,000 prosecutions of people illegally sharing information that was copyrighted have been waged by copyright owners in the United States in pursuing of this war. In Europe, it's actually been more. And in Europe, we've seen the explosion of a strategy to respond to this bad behavior of three strikes laws, which exclude you from being on the internet if three times you're found to have violated these rules. So we have a class here, or a generation, that we're producing of criminals. And as with the war that Sousa launched, this war is inspired because artists and industry are terrified of changes in technology, radical change in technology as it affects culture. For Sousa, he was worried that you would destroy one culture, a read-write culture, to produce another, the read-only culture. Today, it's the reverse. The fear is we're going to destroy the read-only culture in order to produce a different culture, a read-write culture. And as with <coughs> prohibition, the question we should be asking is whether the costs of this war exceed the benefits. Now, to answer that question, we have to think a little bit about what the benefits of copyright are. And as everyone recognizes, or should, copyright is an essential solution to a particular kind of problem, what economists call the problem of externalities. Now, what's an externality? Well, we turn to the source of all truth, Wikipedia. And in Wikipedia, it's explained an externality is an impact, positive or negative, on any party not involved in a given economic transaction. So the impact can be positive or negative. So start with negative externalities. The loud noise from a concert can have an impact on people not attending the concert. The smell of a pig farm can impact people not actually on the pig farm. Pollution can impact people not involved in the production of the material that is producing the pollution. These activities impose costs on others not necessarily involved in the transaction. Economists call these negative externalities. But interesting, there's also positive externalities. So beehives are a positive externality, or vaccinating against certain diseases are a positive externality, or the production of goods like music are a positive externality. Because these activities impose benefits on others, not necessarily involved in the transaction. That's what a positive externality is. That's what an externality is in the general sense. Now, the reason externalities cause problems is that markets ordinarily produce what economists call the inefficient supply of these goods. So it produces too many negative externalities and too few positive externalities. And so the legitimate response of government is to find a way to, quote, internalize the externalities, either positive or negative. So for example, for negative externalities, what we might have is agreements with neighbors and concert stages to make sure that the music doesn't impose costs at times when neighbors want to be sleeping. 
For problems like uh, um, the production of smelly animals, we zone areas to push it into areas where the smell doesn't cause harm to other neighbors. With things like pollution, we regulate to minimize the amount of pollution or to force the polluters to clean up what is polluted. These are interventions to force the producer of the negative externality to, as the economists say, internalize the cost. And the same thing is true with positive externalities. So you might have bee farmers having agreements with other farmers in the area. So the other farmers pay the bee keepers so that the beekeepers have enough incentive to take care of the bees because the bees are taking care of the farm's plants. Or you might have regulation requiring people to have vaccinations as a way to get over the natural tendency for people not to vaccinate enough. Or in the context of music or other creative works, we use a device called copyright law to grant an exclusive right over the creative work for the purpose of overcoming the positive externality. This is an intervention to allow the producers of positive externalities to internalize the benefits. So think about the particular solution that copyright produces. There's some who think <clears throat> that this benefit, the benefit of copyright, is no longer needed. So somebody dissed me on Twitter a while ago, said, I don't agree with Lessig's support of copyright, though I think the, cre I think the creaky, creepy old, creaky old ship should sink not worth saving and start again. I want to identify this attitude, an increasingly important attitude, especially among the young, as an attitude of abolitionism. And my view is that the abolitionists are wrong. My view is copyright is an essential solution to an unavoidable problem, this problem of externalities, without something like this restriction on speech, which copyright is, we'd paradoxically have less speech. So we limit the freedom of people to copy other people's speech openly and selling it, in a sense, to produce more free speech by producing the incentives necessary for at least some people to produce speech they otherwise wouldn't. Now, not for all speech, you know, there's plenty of incentives to tell jokes to friends without somebody having a copyright that they can extract money from the friend they tell the jokes to, but at least some. Maybe books, maybe films, maybe some forms of art. For at least some forms of creative work, my view is copyright is an essential solution to an unavoidable problem. But here's the obvious point. As with privacy, the right regulation for copyright is going to be a function of the technology. And as the technology changes, the architecture of the right regulation is going to change as well. So architectures that made perfectly good sense in one period will make no sense in another because of the changing in tech, uh, changes of technology. And so what we need to do is to adjust the architecture of regulation in light of the new technology to achieve the same value in this different context. So with copyright, what is the right regulation? Well, I think we need to distinguish between the amateur and the professional. And by amateur, I don't mean people who produce amateurishly. I mean people who produce for the love of their production and not for the money. In my view, the copyright system has got to encourage both forms of creativity. It needs to produce incentives for professionals and freedom for the amateur. So how can it do that? Well, how it does that depends upon the technology of creativity. And as this technology changes, the law should change. So we can see something of this change if we just think about how technology has impacted the way people are creating using digital technologies. So think about two periods. First period, somewhere around 2000, where we saw technology extending read-only culture through massively efficient techniques to get and consume culture that had been created elsewhere. This is the poster child for this vision 
of creativity. Apple with its iTunes music store selling music at 99 cents, which you can download to your iPod, of course, only to your iPod. But at least in America, this is considered cool to consume music in this way. This is, as some referred to, a kind of celestial jukebox where we can download from the ether any content we want to consume at any time and consume it. Critically important, in my view, for a rich, both in the sense of money and in the sense of diversity culture. And this efficient production of read-only culture makes culture only richer. But distinct from this read-only culture, we saw beginning around 2004, I think, a revival of the form of culture that Sousa was celebrating, read-write culture. Something like Wikipedia is the poster child, in my view, of read-write culture, but I want to focus on a particular version of it, which I refer to as remix. So let me give you some examples so we are all clear of exactly what I mean by remix. Think in the context of music. Everyone knows this fantastic album by the Beatles called The White Album, which inspired this album by Jay-Z called The Black Album, which inspired this album by DJ Danger Mouse called The Gray Album, which literally synthesizes the tracks of the White Album and Black Album together to produce something new. So that's 2004, two tracks synthesized together. A modern equivalent of that, somebody like Girl Talk, can mix 240 different tracks together in producing a single song. All of it borrowed and remixed. Or think in the context of film. 2004, this film, Tarnation, made its debut at Cannes, said by the BBC to wow Cannes. This was a film the kid made for $218. He took video that he had shot for his whole life and using an iMac given to him by a friend, he was able to remix it to a level and a quality to wow Cannes and win the 2004 Los Angeles International Film Festival. Or think about this form of Japanese creativity called AMVs. Everybody what knows what anime are in Japan, these cartoons increasingly sweeping, at least across the United States. AMVs are, t are made by people taking the anime and setting them to a certain kind of music track. So here's an example. Or here's something a little bit more involved. I think in the context of politics, the last election cycle saw an extraordinary mix in the United States of people remixing political speech to make a certain point. So here's one favorite of mine. Good evening. The first, the second, third, and last presidential debate on I I show 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 show. But now we've heard all the talking points. So let's try to tell the people tonight some things that they they haven't heard. Thank you, Bob. Tom, thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Well, well thank, thank you. Tom, thanks for having me. I think everybody understands. I think everybody knows now we are in the worst financial, financial crisis since the Great Depression. Eight years of failed economic policies promoted by President Bush uh, and supported, supported by Senator McCain. McCain. And our best aid. McCain mentioned looking at our records. And so let's just look at our records. records. An across the board spending freeze. Uh, is a hatchet, and we do need a scalpel. Well, here's something the Obama campaign embraced. How many people saw this? Okay. It was a creed written into the founding documents that declared the destiny of one nation. Yes, we can. It was whispered by slaves and abolitionists. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. 
but this is still my very favorite. It's a Swedish creator, Johan Soderberg. Okay, so this is what I mean by remix. <clears throat> and there's an extraordinary amount of it out there. You can go to sites like this if you don't know about it. Greg Ryder's definitive list of the 98 things you should have already experienced on the internet, unless you're a loser or old or something. <laughs> and what's extraordinary is the way that this practice, this remix, has built communities of remixers. YouTube is now the dominant space where these communities exist. The kind of call and response has produ been produced as people create things which inspires people to create other examples in response. So for example, I found this about a year ago on, on YouTube. About 1.7 million people had seen this. It then inspired this. Of course, about 3.2 million people saw this. <clears throat> and there are about 20 other examples of one copying the other. Or here's another example, this. <clears throat> then inspired this. which then inspired this. <laughs> or here's one more example. I'm sure someone here must have seen this. Kid with a baseball cap sitting in his bedroom. This has been viewed. 65 million times by people on YouTube. And it has been an inspiration for hundreds of other people producing exactly the same kind of rendition of this music. This simple kid sitting in his bedroom is, produces a song which the whole of France could have watched and still not have 65 million people. So the point is to recognize these are increasingly conversations as people create, inspiring other people to create in response to the original creativity. It's the modern equivalent of what Sousa spoke of when Sousa spoke of the young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs. 
But now if, instead of singing them on the corner, out back in one room, they sing them across a digital platform, inspiring people from around the world to build on what other people have created. Now, in my view, the importance here has nothing to do with particular techniques, because of course, everything you saw here could have been produced by filmmakers 10 or 20 years ago. The importance is that the, the technique has been democratized. It's anybody with access to a $1,500 computer who can make sounds and images and share them with people across the world in a way that was completely unimaginable just 25 years ago. Now, the thing to recognize is you think about this read-only and read-write culture, it's not as if the future is going to be either one or the other. What we're increasingly seeing is the way the future is both of these things together. The future is a future increasingly mixing read-only and read-write culture, increasingly producing a hybrid between the two as people use digital technologies to speak in the way Sousa celebrated. But the problem here is that the law does not fit this extraordinarily optimistic practice. The law has a very different attitude about these two forms of creativity. While the law is designed to endorse and protect read-only culture, the law is designed to reject the freedom of read-write culture, weakening this read-write culture. Now, why is that, you might ask? And the thing to recognize is there's a very simple technical reason why the law opposes this read-write creativity while embracing read-only creativity. And the answer has, the reason for this has to do with the architecture of copies and architecture of copyright law. So if copyright law at its core regulates something called copies, <clears throat> what we know about digital technologies is that every single time you use some bits of culture, you are producing a copy. Now, that is a radical change over how we experience culture before the digital age. For example, think about a book in real space. If these are all the uses of a book, an important set of these uses are just technically unregulated by the law. So if you read a book, that's not a fair use of the book, it's a free use of the book, because to read a book is not to produce a copy. To give someone a book is not a regulated use of the book because to give someone a book is not to produce a copy. In the United States, the law explicitly exempts selling of books from the reach of the copyright owner because to sell a book is not to produce a copy. To sleep on a book is not an act regulated by any copyright system because to sleep on a book is not to produce a copy. These uses of this creative work are then free and balanced against a set of uses which the law of copyright purports to control in order to create the incentives that create creators need to produce great new work. So if you want to publish a book, you need permission of the copyright owner because to publish a book is to produce a copy. And then in the American tradition, there's these thin slivers of exceptions, uses called fair uses, uses which otherwise would have been regulated by the law because they involve making a copy, but which the law says ought to remain free. So for example, you can quote a passage in a book, in a review of the book, a critical review, because though there's a copy involved, the law says that type of copying should be privileged. Enter the internet, where the basic architecture of digital technologies is that every single use produces a copy. And we go from this world of a relative balance between free uses and regulated uses to a world where presumptively every use is regulated merely because the platform through which we get access to our culture has changed. So it's in this sense that the law supports read-only culture, law supports the business model of read-only culture, because if the law regulates copies, then it's giving perfect control over every time a copy is made in this digital environment. And it's for this reason the law rejects read-write culture, renders it illegal, because in the production and dissemination of read-write culture, there is a copy made which has not been authorized by the copyright owner. 
So DJ Danger Mouse knew that the Beatles never give permission to remix their works, didn't even try to secure the permission. This kid found that when he could wow Can for $218, it would cost more than $400,000 to clear the rights to the music in the background of the stuff that he had remixed in order to distribute it broadly. Increasingly, AMVs are finding notice and takedowns from lawyers who are representing artists who don't like the fact that their work has been remixed in this particular way. And this still is my very favorite example. I don't care what you think about Tony Blair. I don't care what you think about George Bush. I don't care what you think about the war. <clears throat> the one thing you can't say about this video made by this extraordinary creator, Johann Soderberg, is what the lawyers said when Soderberg asked permission to remix these images with this song by Lionel Richie. The lawyer said, no, you cannot have our permission because, quote, it's not funny, end quote. <laughs> so the point is the law supports the read-only culture and rejects the read-write culture. Now, the thing we need to recognize here is, number one, no one in a place like this, the United States Congress, or in a place like this, ever thought about this fact about the way digital technologies interact with copyright law. There's no such thing as the ATM RICA Act, the Act to Massively Regulate Every Creative Act Act. What we've got instead is the unintended interaction between an architecture of regulation and an architecture of technology producing this space of in principle perfect control. And number two, we need to recognize that there is a wide range of creative work. So there's creative work like this, and creative work like this, and creative work like blogs like this, and creative work like this. Some of that creative work is professional. Some of that creative work is amateur. And certainly the professional is dependent upon the copyright system to produce the incentives necessary to support that professional creativity. But the amateur creativity is often not. Indeed, not just not dependent upon the copyright system. The copyright system is increasingly affirmatively harmful to this form of creativity. Nonetheless, the business model of Hollywood, the business model that presumes everyone needs the perfect control of the read-only culture, is getting applied across the full range of this creativity. Ignorance of the way that that business model destroys certain forms of creativity. So while it might help in the context of this kind of creativity, this model of control uh, would really, really hurt other forms of creativity as the creativity cannot begin to clear the rights necessary even to express itself in a non-commercial amateur way by people sharing it across the internet. So the problem is law out of sync with the technology. And just as with the Fourth Amendment, the law needs to be updated. Copyright law needs to be updated. It needs a substantial update here, not just tinkering. And it's here that I want to use the story I told about the moose. Because the question is, how do we get people to see and the way Jefferson used the moose to get them to see the point about the need for the update. What is the frame? And I've spent the last decade following through three different ideas at least to try to get them to see it. So one frame to get them to see the moose is to talk about efficiency. So for example, think about this company, Google, which launched a product they originally called Print, now is called Google Book Search. The aim of Google Book Search is to Googleize books the way they've Googleized the web, right? so that you can search books the way you can search the web. So what would that mean? Well, Google said there were three categories of books they were thinking about. There were 18 million books in the libraries they were thinking about making accessible. 9% of those books were books that were in copyright and still in print. 16% of those books are books that are in the public domain leaving 75% of those books as books that are presumptively under copyright, but no longer in print, meaning no longer is there any obvious person to ask for permission to do anything with those books. So Google Book Search Project decided they would adopt different 
technology strategies with respect to each of these categories. First, they would scan all 18 million books, and then they would grant access to these books differentially depending on the category that each book fell within. So there are three categories. The public domain books, Google grants full access to this book. You can download a PDF of the book for free, put it on your computer, do anything you want with it. Then with respect to these works, the works presumptively under copyright, Google was going to offer at least snippet access to the books. And snippets look literally like this, snippets of paper. So you search on a term and you get these little tears out of the book that you can see that the book involves the terms or the terms that you're searching for. And then you have a simple way to click to a library or a used bookstore to buy a copy of that book. And then with respect to the 9% of books that are still in print and still under copyright, Google was going to give as much permission as the authors or publishers would allow. And they could get that permission because they knew with whom to speak because they're still in print and so there is a company who can take responsibility. So here's an example of a book in that category. Search on the return of economics and what you're going to see is a couple pages around that, not just a snippet. Now, as you might have heard, not everyone loves Google. Not everyone loves the Google Book Search Project. And as you no doubt recognize, in the United States, when you don't love someone, what you do is eventually get around to suing them. So in 2005, the Authors Guild and the Association of American Publishers sued Google. And the essence of their claim was, before Google could have permission to scan any of the books that were still in copyright, uh, they needed to get the explicit permission of a copyright owner. So what would that mean? 16% is in the public domain they could scan because it's not under copyright. With respect to the 9% still in print, they could get permission. Indeed, they had permission from all of the publishers to do exactly this with respect to the works that were still under copyright and still in print. But if the law says that they have to get permission before they can scan something presumptively under copyright, that means that 75% of these works are essentially invisible inside of any such digital library, orphans. So look at this example, and you might see a moose. You might see an example that makes you recognize the extraordinary important need to update or change this law. Well, if that doesn't do for you, think about another example, one tied to creativity. Um, here's a site, through-u.com, that is made simply by taking YouTube clips and remixing them together. So here's a little bit of our video. Now the point to recognize is there's no way to make this creativity legally. There's no way to clear the rights necessary to engage in this remix of this stuff that's put out there on YouTube freely. It's impossible to do that legally, so you might look at this and be inspired as this is your moose, your example that gets you to see why this is a completely different reality from the one you thought before. Or three, you might think about the problem in this profound way, I think, the futility of the existing architecture of regulation. So this is the part that focuses on something we call piracy or peer-to-peer -peer piracy. What my friend Jack Valente called terrorism, where of course it's our kids who are the terrorists here. The point to recognize in this part of the story is that this war, this war of prohibition, simply has not worked if by worked you mean reduce the bad behavior. 
These are graph of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. This line in the middle is the point where the Supreme Court finally declared it unambiguously illegal to engage in this kind of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. And as you notice, peer-to-peer -peer file sharers don't apparently read Supreme Court opinions because there's no substantial change in peer-to-peer -peer file sharing in response to this law. All that this regulation has done is to render a generation of our kids criminal. And of course, here, it's inspired a movement around a particular party, and it might be that movement, that party, that framing of this war as absurd that gets you to see why this is different, gets you to see the moose. Now, you can pick one of these. You can pick any one of these. I don't care. Any one of these examples, I think, gives you a reason to think about changing the existing architecture of regulation. So how will we change it? Well, I'm going to talk about changes in law and changes in us. First changes in law. The first change I think we need here is to recognize that the law needs to become efficient in the way in which it tries to regulate access to our culture. And we should do that, I think, by shifting some of the obligation of copyright back to the copyright owner. So an obligation to maintain the copyright, meaning make it clear who owns what, so that the 75% of works in the libraries that we all share are not works for whom we have no clear idea who is the copyright owner. So imagine a system that said every five years you had to register or take steps to register the work um, in a universal and open and free registry so that nobody has an exclusive access to that registry. At least using that registry, we could know who owns what. That obligation, which would say if you don't register, the work passes into the public domain or passes into a space where there's some cheap compulsory license for it, would at least filter out the world of creative work that we have no idea who owns and therefore can't clear permissions before we make it accessible. That's number one. Second. Copyright law has got to give up its obsession with the copy. Right, so this idea that somehow copyright law should be triggered every time there is a copy is an idea that made sense in a world where copies were the exception. But where copies are as common as breathing, this world is, this regulation is, this is a technical term, insane. Instead, the law should be focusing on activities that are meaningful in achieving the objective of copyright. And in the digital age, copies are not a meaningful act. Meaningful should be determined in the context of use. Now, here's a way to think about it. Distinguish between copies that you would make of a work, a complete copy of a book, for example, and a remix of that work. That's one distinction. Then distinguish between the professional and the amateur someone creating for the profession, and someone creating just for the love of creating. Put those together in this geeky law professor-like way. You have a matrix. Copyright law, as it's architected right now, presumptively regulates all of this in exactly the same way. And the point I've been making is that copyright has never before regulated this broadly, and it makes no sense for it to be regulating this broadly now. Instead, it's perfectly clear, at least in this category, professionals who want to control copies of their professionally created work. Copyright law has a legitimate, important role. But it's equally clear that in this space, amateurs engaging in the remix of other people's creativity for amateur purposes, that form of creativity should be free of copyrights regulation. Not a fair use, not a use that requires you to have a lawyer to clear what you're doing, but a use that presumptively is not even touched by copyright law. And then between these two extremes, there are mixed categories. So when an amateur shares copies of his Madonna music with his 100,000 best friends on a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing service, there might be some legitimate reason to worry about whether Madonna is being adequately compensated in that context. So some sharing is legitimate, some not. And in the context of professional remixing, so the activity that is engaged with in by people like Girl Talk is presumptively creative and I think should be set aside from copyrights regulation. But turning a book into a movie or translating a work is another kind of remix is something that I think legitimately is regulated by copyright law. 
But when you see these four boxes together, the central claim that I'm making about how copyright needs to change is that it needs to deregulate a significant part of culture to stop attempting to regulate as broadly as it does, stop regulating at least a significant space of culture, and instead focus its regulation where the regulation could do good. And third, finally, in the context of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, what we think of as, quote, piracy. <clears throat> so we're at a decade into this war on peer-to-peer -peer file, uh, file sharing, a war which has totally failed. And the response of some people to a completely failed war, like my comrades in the United States, is to wage an ever more effective war against the enemy, the Vietnam strategy, or maybe the Iraq strategy, or maybe the Afghanistan strategy. But my response is the opposite here. When you've waged a war that you recognize cannot succeed, it's time to sue for peace and to find alternatives to the objective you were pursuing that doesn't require you to wage a war. And here, for the last decade, there have been a host of proposals out there to deal with the problem of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, from compulsory licenses to voluntary collective licensing, each of these recognizing that we can produce the compensation copyright law needs without attempting to control every time anybody for any purpose shares a bit of culture with someone else. Now the thing to recognize about these suggestions for alternative modes of, rec of regulation is that if we had had these a decade ago, if we had adopted these measures in 1999, there have been three changes. Importantly for the artists, the artists would have had more money because they make no money under illegal peer-to-peer -peer file sharing right now, but if there were a system that were regulating and taxing and redistributing money on the basis of the sharing, at least they would have benefited from that. Second, we would have had more businesses engaging in competition of new ways to use this creative work and make it accessible instead of the extraordinary chill that these lawsuits have produced on any business trying to experiment with new ways to produce and share content. But the part most important to me as I look at my kids just beginning to use technology is, number three, we would not have a generation of criminals raised to recognize that their behavior is illegal and accepting their life engaging in this illegal behavior. Those are changes in law. Equally importantly, we need changes in us, maybe the US, but maybe us more generally. We need to learn to practice balance here to stop thinking about this kind of regulation as if it has to be extreme and perfect and recognize instead the range of creative forms of engagement that need different kinds of protection. That was the objective of the nonprofit we started seven years ago called Creative Commons. So Creative Commons is a project that seeks a simple way for copyright owners, for authors, to mark their content with the freedoms they intended to carry. So rather than the all rights reserved model that copyright explicitly states, there's a some rights reserved model. Some reserved to the authors, others given to the public. So for example, here's the range of freedoms that you can signal, the freedom to share the work, the freedom to remix the work, or both. Then you can impose certain limitations on the freedoms you're granting, the freedoms to do it only for non-commercial purposes or the freedom to do it so long as what you create, you allow others to share in the way that you have shared the work you've created from or both. So if you put these freedoms and restrictions together, you can produce a license and a license comes in three separate layers. One later is this human readable commons deed that expresses in terms that anybody should be able to understand the freedoms associated with the content. Second and very different is a lawyer readable license, a billion page document written by the best lawyers we can find around the world to make enforceable the freedoms and restrictions associated with the content. And third and most important in my view is a machine readable expression of the freedoms and restrictions associated with the content so that machines can begin to identify what you can do with content based on the code hidden behind the content. So here's an example of how this works. This is a favorite <clears throat> song of mine called My Life, composed by a guy named Colin Mutchler. He produced a guitar version of this, uploaded it to a site that encouraged Creative Commons Remix. 
It was downloaded by a 17-year-old violinist named Cora Beth. She added the violin track on top. Then she renamed the new song, My Life Changed. And she made it available for many other people to remix. And there have been extraordinary remixes of it. Some of it fantastic, some a little embarrassing. There's a Japanese remix, My Life Changed, absolutely, which I don't show many people often. But the point is that this act of shared creativity engaged in by these two creators who never met each other and never spoke to each other was consistent with the underlying law of copyright with any, without any lawyer standing in the middle. And that's the objective of the project, to simplify the regulation and make it invisible to the creator so the creator can respect the underlying copyright law without the underlying copyright law blocking exactly the kind of read-write creativity the technology is encouraging. So we launched this in 2003. And over that period of time, the number of works licensed in this space has exploded to more than 150 million objects now licensed in this space. So Flickr has an extraordinary collection of photographs that are all licensed in CC ways. There have been very famous examples of artists who have produced work uh, that is explicitly licensed like this. So Girl Talk is also one of them. Nine Inch Nails is another. Extremely important uh, news sites, including, for example, Al Jazeera, which makes its raw footage of the stuff that it's shooting in the Middle East available for anybody, for any purpose at all, to use in news production or any other purpose they want. Just this year, the White House made all of its content available under a Creative Commons license. And just this year, after many years of negotiation, Wikipedia relicensed all of its content under a Creative Commons license. The objective to use this platform, this infrastructure, to enable these activities of voluntary sharing that a wide range of creators, indeed most creators, presumptively want their creativity to include. So that's something of the changes in us, moving us into a space where we more explicitly and easily can give the freedoms that we take for granted when we think about how we engage with culture in real space. That's the end of the argument. I want to end this talk, though, with one more story. <clears throat> so I was invited to come speak at this place. This is the Association of the Bar of the City of New York. It was a panel that was going to talk about copyright law. Uh, and it was held in this extremely beautiful room filled with velvet car uh, curtains and uh, carpet. And the room was filled that evening with people, packed artists, creators, some lawyers, eager to listen to the series of talks about how they could create, consistent with the American law of, quote, fair use. So the American law of fair use, fair use has four different factors that the court has said have to be considered individually and always have to be weighed together. So the people who were designing this event decided they would take each of these four factors, and they would ask four different lawyers to spend 15 minutes talking about each factor. And they reasoned 60 minutes later, the whole room would understand the law of fair use and could go out and create consistent with the law. But as I sat there looking out in the room, the reaction I saw was something more like this. <laughs> as people were increasingly bewildered recognizing there was no way they could possibly create consistent with the law, because they couldn't even begin to understand what the restrictions the law were imposing on them. And I began to daydream as I saw this reaction. And I began to wonder, what did this space remind me of? Because I had, ex I had done a lot of work earlier in my life, in fact, when I was in college, that began to, had lots of rooms like this that I was exposed to. And as I began to recognize the link that I had drawn between this earlier life of mine spent traveling through former so what's now the former Soviet republics, I began to wonder when was it in the history of the Soviet system when you could convince people inside the Soviet system that the system had failed. Right? 1976 was too early. I mean, it's still puttering along pretty much working. 1989 was too late. If you didn't get it by 1989, you were never going to get it. So when was it between 76 and 79, 89, that you could have convinced them that the system had failed? And more importantly, what could you have said to them to convince them this romantic ideal that they were born with had crashed and burned, and to continue with the Soviet system 
was to display a certain kind of insanity. Because as I listen to my colleagues, lawyers, us, or at least us in the United States, insist, nothing has changed. The same rules should apply. It's the pirates who are the deviants. Well, that might be true, but the pirates who are the deviants. I recognize it is we who are insane. That the existing system, the existing architecture of copyright law could never work in the digital age. Either we will stop creating or we will incite a revolution to overthrow this system of regulation. And in my view, both options are not acceptable. We need to recognize that there is a growing abolitionist movement out there, a movement that thinks we need no more the regulation of copyright law and should just get on with the task of dismantling it. I am against abolitionism. In this sense, I'm more like Gorbachev and less like Yeltsin. I'm not trying to completely remake the system. I'm an old communist who's trying to find a way to preserve the communism in this new world against these two extremes. Now, you may not be similarly motivated. You might not care about whether copyright law survives. You might, like Yeltsin, be happy to see it crash and burn and dissolve. So if that's who you are, let me try one final plea about this. The thing we need to recognize as cultures attempting to advance this war against our kids is that we can't kill this form of creativity. We can only criminalize it. We're not going to stop our kids from using technology to create in ways that we never imagined when we were growing up. We can only drive that creativity underground. We're not going to make them passive, the way at least I was growing up. We're only going to be able to make them, quote, pirates. And the question is, is that any good? In the United States, kids live in these age of prohibitions, an extraordinary range of their life. They constantly live life against the law. And that life is extraordinarily corrosive, extraordinarily corrupting of the rule of law in a democracy. So if anything here, recognizing that corrosive, corrupting effect should be a motive here and elsewhere to at least get us to stop this war against our kids now. Thanks very much. <laughs>